Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Seidner, Chief Investment Officer of Non-Traditional Strategies at PIMCO. It is my pleasure to be joined by Dr. Ben Bernanke, uh, both a colleague and a friend. He is former chair of the U.S. Federal Reserve and deftly steered the economy and the central bank through the Great Recession and the global financial crisis. He is a senior advisor to PIMCO and chairs our global advisory board. Investors are hoping for more stability in interest rates in 2024. Today, we'll explore if and how that can happen. Ben, let's start um, with financial conditions. It's been a volatile couple months, actually three or four months in, in financial markets, a pretty steep increase in interest rates in September and October, with 10-year Treasury notes touching 5%. And then a pretty rapid decline in interest rates in, in November and so far in December. Can you tell us um, or talk through your broad reading on financial conditions now, particularly given the historically significant policy tightening that we've seen over the last 18 to 24 months? Sure, Mark. Um, the Federal Reserve would say that conditions are relatively tight, given that the uh, federal funds rate has been uh, increased by 500 basis points uh, in a relatively rapid uh, succession, um, given that uh, federal funds rate and longer-term interest rates are higher than inflation, so that real interest rates are high. And you could look at some sectors like the mortgage sector and see you know, pretty uh, constrained conditions. But if you look uh, at uh, indicate other indicators, uh, it, it's a little bit more of a mixed story. You know, We've seen bond prices uh, go up. We've seen the stock prices go up recently. If you look at uh, indicators like the Chicago Fed's National Financial Conditions Index, you find that overall, taking into account all financial assets, the dollar and other things, that financial conditions are actually a bit easier than the historical average. So there's a little bit of a contradiction there. Uh, I think the Fed would argue that uh, the tightening of conditions relative to 21 uh, and the current level will be sufficient to continue the slowing of the economy, which has already begun and which they uh, feel they need to get inflation back to target. The Federal Reserve updated its um, summary of economic uh, projections for the path of interest rates and, and for the economy. They revised down slightly for 2024 their expectation for inflation. They revised down slightly their expectation for GDP growth. And there was a meaningful reduction in expectations for where policy will land uh, towards the end of, 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 of 2024. How should market participants interpret uh, the latest projections? People who follow the Fed uh, look often at the so-called dot plot which uh, records the individual projections of the participants of the FOMC as to where they think uh, the federal funds rate, the policy rate, ought to go over the next couple of years. Um, and the, the, uh, the dot plot this time uh, showed first that the uh, mo most participants, or essentially all participants, think that uh, a further increase in rates is pretty much off the table. And they saw uh, three cuts uh, during 2024, which is more than they had previously expected and suggests that they are really open to the idea uh, to begin to cut rates. Um, this is based on a view which is also very positive. Their, uh, the summary of economic projections includes their forecasts uh, for the economy, and they see both inflation coming down to target by the end of next year, early 2025, and an unemployment rate that doesn't go above uh, 4.1. So that's that's what we call a soft landing. And that's something that uh, there's a lot of skepticism whether the Fed could pull that off. But at least uh, for the moment, uh, participants at the FOMC think that that's going to happen. Um, this uh, this pivot or, or change in view, uh, which has been driven by good inflation data in, in recent uh, months, I, I do want to give a few caveats. First, the dot plot and the forecasts are done by individual participants uh, in the FOMC uh, without, no, it's not part of the, of the meeting. It's not an official pronouncement of the FOMC. Secondly, um, there was an awful lot of disagreement. If you looked at the dot plot, uh, while the median suggested three cuts in 2024, the range of possibilities, according to participants, was quite wide. Uh, suggesting there's a lot of uncertainty and disagreement about uh, how rate policy was going to evolve. And the final point to make is that, of course, these uh, 
these projections are all contingent on the data. So if we come to a situation where the inflation data take a bad turn or the economy looks like it's reaccelerating, you could see a significant change and presumably a, a tightening of financial conditions. Ben, as you know from your interactions with, with PIMCO's investment committee, we, we tend to build portfolios across a wide range of scenarios without banking on one particular outcome or another. That said, we've, 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 we've had a, a pretty optimistic outlook for the bond market, particularly given uh, valuation and, and the rise in rates uh, in, in, in recent, recent months. Um, right now, um, many areas of, of financial markets are pretty confident in rate cuts in 2024 by not just the Federal Reserve, but by, by, by global central banks. Can you talk a little bit about why? and what tools the Fed will be using to ascertain when the timing might be right uh, and, and, and what order of magnitude might be appropriate for policy reduction in 2024? So the Federal Reserve is very focused on getting uh, inflation and they target uh, a particular index called uh, PCE inflation, not the CPI. They're very, uh, they're very focused on getting that back to their 2% target and things are moving very decidedly in the right direction, so that's good. Um, the, uh, why would they uh, uh, stop uh, tightening? Well, first, if they were convinced that inflation was on a path that was going to get to 2%, and they evaluate uh, different components of inflation, uh, just to give one example, uh, rents are a very big share of um, of inflation in terms of the basket that is used to measure inflation. And there's a, a very good uh, expectation that, uh, that rent uh, statistics uh, will begin to come down over the next few months, given that new leases that are being signed across the country are showing actual declines uh, in rent in many cities. So they, they believe that uh, inflation will be coming down and it's already to some extent uh, built in so uh, why cut? Well, uh, one reason would be that we don't need uh, as tight a policy anymore, that uh, we don't want to um, uh, unnecessarily uh, slow the economy. Uh, secondly, uh, you, you don't wait, as uh, Jay Powell has emphasized a number of times, you, you don't want to wait until you get to 2% to begin to cut because policy works with a lag. And if you did that, you would end up with inflation undershooting the 2% target. So you've got to, you've got to move in advance of, uh, of inflation reaching 2%. Um, and a third reason, uh, which has been emphasized recently by Governor Waller, is that as inflation falls, given the interest rate, given the nominal interest rate, the real interest rate sort of passively increases. That is, given the nominal interest rate, falling inflation means that inflation uh, is you know falling relative to the interest rate, it makes uh, the real cost of money higher. So just to avoid that problem, a passive tightening, you would want to cut. So all of these factors lean in the direction uh, of cutting as long as inflation is um, uh, is moving in the right direction. Now, why would you delay cutting? Just a couple reasons uh, to mention. One is that uh, while it looks like uh, the um, uh, economy is uh, slowing. Uh, there's always the possibility that uh, you know it could begin to reaccelerate, and so what the Fed is looking for is a, an economy which is growing a bit below uh, its uh, long-run potential growth rate. Uh, and so you don't want to overstimulate the economy. You know when you've got things on on a good track. Another reason is that um, the data month to month can be very noisy. And the Fed has already had a few head fakes where they thought inflation was coming down and then the data the next month or a revision of the data showed that progress was not as great as they expected. So uh, I think they'll be patient. Um, I, I, I would think that the market view that cuts will come as soon as March. Personally, I would go a little later than that, but it's a very, very hard thing to judge. Can the economy remain resilient in 2024? I suppose one of the surprises of, of 2023 has been that inflation has moderated to the extent that it has without an increase in the unemployment rate or without a, a, a decline, really, in economic uh, activity. Do we need areas like the labor market 
uh, to weaken or the housing market to weaken to get inflation back to the 2% inflation target or effectively be able to navigate that last mile from 2 point something to 2.0? So there's really two questions there. One is, do we need a recession to get inflation down? And then the second question is, will we in fact have a recession going forward? And let me talk about the first one. Do we need a recession? The answer is no. And the reason is that uh, this inflation is not uh, your grandfather's inflation. This is not like many inflations in the post-war period that were driven by overheated demand. Instead, inflation this time, as the Fed has recognized and as economists generally have recognized, uh, has a very substantial supply side component to it. Uh, that includes, for example, uh, the big increases in energy prices and food prices uh, that came about first because of the reopening of the global economy after the pandemic, and then secondly, uh, because of the Russia-Ukraine war, which added uh, further uh, pressure on, on commodity prices. So those uh, commodity prices going up first obviously directly add to inflation, but they also indirectly add to inflation by raising inflation expectations. People see gas prices go up, so they say, well, I need a higher wage. Um, and by raising costs, you know, transportation prices go up when uh, fuel prices go up, for example. So that was the one important supply element. Second one was uh, the so famous uh, supply chain problem. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, people switched their spending very much from services. Instead of going to the gym, they switched to goods. They bought a treadmill uh, at home. Um, and so this big switch, very substantial switch from services to goods put pressure on the ability of firms to deliver those goods. And that pressure was made even worse by the famous supply chain problems. So prices of cars and other durable goods uh, shot up. Um, and contributed very much to the inflation. And, and finally, and this was something perhaps that should have been better anticipated, uh, as the pandemic ended, people didn't come right back to work. Um, uh, besides working from home, many just didn't, uh, didn't get reemployed, and participation rates were low, and it, there was a shortage of workers. And that, too, was putting pressure on wages and prices. And, and what's been happening is that all of these things – uh, have been reversing. Uh, energy prices have come down recently. Uh, food prices have flattened out. The supply chains are in much better shape. We got much better participation in the labor market. All these supply side uh, improvements um, have contributed to uh, lower inflation. It's not to say there aren't demand side factors. There are, but uh, the improvement of uh, on the supply side it gives you sort of a painless disinflation. It doesn't involve a slowing economy. In fact, it, it probably adds to economic growth. So that uh, it's still true that uh, the Fed will have to um, slow the economy somewhat because there are still demand side pressures um, arising, uh, for example, from uh, fiscal and monetary policy at the end of the pandemic and, and other factors. Uh, and the labor market is still quite tight, but uh, they've already made a lot of progress uh, in slowing the labor market. The second question, briefly, is will we, in fact, anyway, have a recession? That's a little harder to say. We have had um, some slowing. We have had a Fed tightening. Um, it's very hard to calibrate exactly how big that effect is. There are other forces that we can't anticipate. Uh, my sense is that we'll either have a very mild recession or no recession at all. So in either case, I would call that a soft landing. My, my confidence is based on the fact that Consumers are in great shape, relatively speaking, financially, uh, and that's supporting their consumer spending along with uh, strong labor income. Um, so we're only seeing a very moderate uh, decline in sectoral, uh, cyclically sensitive sectors like uh, construction and manufacturing. So I would guess that uh, we will not see a serious recession. It's possible that there'll be a technical recession with a modest increase in unemployment, but uh, that would probably require new shocks that are not yet on the horizon. 